in pharmacokinetics, not only do we need a little bit of um, imagination in thinking where the different you know, molecules um, are going in our body, okay? We not only need a little bit of mathematical interpretation so as to derive things like the onset or the duration of action, uh, which also reflect the processes that we're trying to imagine uh, with regards to our body's way of taking care of the molecules inside us, the drug molecules, we also need a little bit of chemical background. And this is where we try to relate the idea of ionization and polarity to the processes, including absorption and elimination. Okay, so we remember that polarity of drug molecules, well, actually of all molecules, would depend on the presence or absence of electronegative atoms. And electronegative atoms such as oxygen, nitrogen, and halogens will most likely impart partial negative charges on them. And then on the atoms that are beside them, usually carbon or hydrogen, those would become partially positive. And those partial charges, okay, or those dipoles are the things which make them polar, those molecules polar. In the case of drugs, it's the same principle, okay? Not only is this the only thing we need to remember with regards to relating drug structure to pharmacokinetic processes, you should also remember that different functional groups may have different behaviors. Remember that there are some functional groups that we can call as weak acids, like carboxylic acids, right? The carboxyl group COOH, like here, can actually become COO minus in the ionized state, but there are weak bases, okay? So a weakly basic functional group, the most common one is the amino group, which would have also its ionization state, either the positive charge, or if it's not ionized, of course, it's neutral, okay? And of course, we should remember that any functional group that can ionize, like a carboxyl or an amino group, would have a pKa value. Now, uh, that means that we should always consider two things, the pKa of a certain functional group in a drug molecule and the pH of the environment. Now, if you're going straight to this discussion without any background in your general chemistry with regards to acid-base equilibria, or better, probably a background on ionization of amino acids in biochemistry, uh, it might help you to go back to that first, okay? Or if, if it's something you forgot already, it would be nice to review it. But if you think you're ready to interpret it straight away, then proceed. So we remember that depending on whether the functional group is weakly acidic or weakly basic, it may behave in different ways depending on whether the pH is high or low or whether it is in the basic environment right, high pH, basic, or low pH, or the acidic environment, okay? Namely, if we have, first of all, let's focus on the uh, column for the weak acid. If we have a weakly acidic group like COOH in an acidic environment, like acid and acid, 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 it would be non-polar, or it would be neutral, or it will not be charged, it will be unionized. I hope that uh, for you, who's already watching this one, you're, you should know that those words I have just mentioned are pretty much similar or even synonymous, right? But in high pH values, in fact, specifically the pH that is high enough to exceed the pKa of that group, then it will become negatively charged. But the behavior for amino groups or weak bases are different. In low uh, environments, in acidic environments, you have the positive charge to it, it will be something like NH3 plus. But in high pH environments, so if you have a weak base in a basic environment, it will be neutral, it will have no charge, okay? And what does this remind us? It should remind us that whether you have a charge or not will tell whether you are polar or non-polar, right? If you have a charge or if you are ionized, you are polar. And if you are polar, if the mo molecule is polar in its current state, then it should be able to easily dissolve in water, okay? That's why we call it hydrophilic. And why is this important in pharmacokinetics? Guess what? 
we would do well to remember that most of the way that our, most of the ways by which our body gets rid of our metabolites or excretes them is by uh, aqueous secretions, right? Saliva is aqueous. Sweat is aqueous. And of course, most importantly, urine is aqueous. So there's really a great chance for most drug molecules to go out of our body if they are in the ionized state. And that's why we have to study when our weak acids and bases will ionize. Similarly, if we know the state by which our drug molecules have no charge or unionized and, or nonpolar, we remember that lipids in biochemistry are also nonpolar. That makes them lipophilic. So what does being neutral have to do with pharmacokinetics? Remember, most of the barriers to our body the barriers to absorption, and even barriers to distribution to different organs would be made up of cell membranes, which are, if you go back to our basic biology, made up in turn of phospholipids. So you have to go through phospholipids by being nonpolar, or by being nonpolar, you can go through them. So that actually means that there's a greater chance of absorption if a drug molecule would be in the neutral or an ionized state. Oh man, remember we have ADME as the four main processes, right? So it's like saying that the state which governs absorption and distribution would be in the lipophilic or nonpolar state. That's why, you know, for, for at least my peers here, we use the mnemonic luna. And then for excretion, again, to bodily fluids, we can remember hype or hype, I don't know what you want to pronounce that, hydrophilic ionized polar excreted. And therefore, it is not surprising that when we go to a little more videos on these individual processes like absorption or excretion, we need to revisit again this very principle of ionization.